Sound King. Okay. Today is April 23rd, 2018, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Lee Ellis, who served in the U.S. Air Force during the Vietnam War. Mr. Ellis's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Ellis, and thank you for participating. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live, please? Yes. My real name is Leon F. Ellis, Jr. I go by Lee Ellis. I live in Dawsonville, Georgia, actually between Gainesville and Dawsonville. It's really just the outer, outer uh, suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about your early life, please? Yes, I grew up on a farm between Athens and Commerce, Georgia. Uh, this was uh, kind of growing up in the 50s. I was born in 1943, so growing up in the 50s on the farm. Uh, my grandfather had been a farmer. He w we lived with him, or he lived with us. We moved in. My grandmother died and kind of took care of my grandfather, and he was kind of winding down on his farming days, but we still had mules. He had a pair of mules when I was real young. Eventually, we sold off to, he sold off the pair of mules, and we had one mule that we used for gardening, and we had a full acre of garden. So there was always a lot of work to do there. And then we did some farming ourselves. So we grew corn and uh, some hay and some wheat and some oats from time to time. And uh, as a 12 and 13 year old boy, I was plowing uh, that mule in the garden and in the cornfields and so on. So I have, uh, before I, shortly before I flew supersonic jets, I was on the south end of a northbound mule. So, <laughs> It was a unique experience. You think about plowing mules, and people have been doing plowing oxen for thousands of years, and there I was in doing that, and then flying a supersonic jet shortly thereafter. It's a very unique time in history. I loved being outdoors, and when I was, uh, to back up a little bit, when I was five, my parents took me and my brother, one brother, down to Athens, Georgia, to the Veterans Park, and there on pedestal they had a static airplane from World War II, as they often do in Veterans Parks, and it was a World War II fighter airplane. And I climbed up on that airplane, and it was like, okay, this is me. This is what I do. This is going to be my future. And so I went home, and I would get the we had a swing on the old front porch, as farmhouses often did, and I would get that swing going as high as I could go, and then I would drop my mother's cushions out of, for my bombing passes. <laughs> So that was my introduction to flying. And then model airplanes, the balsa woods that we would toss. I never had a radio control when I didn't have our hand control. When I, that seemed too complicated and cost more money than I had to spend. So I just bought the 29 cent balsa wood ones that you could throw. Carved some airplanes uh, out of pine wood. And then during the Korean War, uh, many flights would come over our farm, and so I would be out in the fields of the garden, and I would look up and see those formations of airplanes going over. So even though I was working the dirt, my heart was really in the sky, and that's where I wanted to be. I always loved being outdoors. I loved adventure, but cautious. My mother was a school teacher and a brilliant woman. She had graduated from the University of Georgia uh, with a Phi Kappa Phi and that kind of stuff. She actually kept house and lived with a woman and cooked for her and kept house to earn her room and board so she could go to school. And when she, my gr mother graduated from the University of Georgia in 1931, her father sold a pair of mules and, or traded, actually traded a pair of mules with a little bit of money, some money to go along and bought her a 1931 Ford. And uh, that was kind of her going away present. <laughs> And she went off to South Georgia and became a home demonstration agent. But my mom was, uh, was quite a, a character and a, and a great influence on all of us. So uh, growing up in that home, we experienced uh, a, a lot of exposure to uh, intellectual things. She went back when the uh, uh, Sputnik went up. The government funded the National Science Foundation and she got a scholarship to go get her master's in science and teach science. So then I got exposed to my mother going back to college in, in a master's program in science. So I got exposed to a lot of science and so I was always interested in those kind of things. 
uh, model airplanes. And uh, in the eighth grade, I sat in uh, the library was my home room. And I sat next to the A's. I think it was by chance, but I sat next to the A's and that we'd go in for 15 minutes every morning and get the roll call. And I'd reach over and pull a book out with an A on it, like aeronautical engineering, airplanes, aircraft recognition. And I would sit there and read for 10 or 15 minutes and becoming more familiar with airplanes. Then in high school, uh, I got into athletics and, in, and my bro mother's brother had played football at the University of Georgia in the late 1920s. And he had two sons that were playing at University of Georgia in the 1950s when I was, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And so football, my mother was a great football fan. And she knew all the players. I mean, she just was a fan of sports, but especially football. And so uh, growing up there, it was so easy to get to the University of Georgia. I started watching games for a dollar, student tickets when I was in the ninth grade. But I actually went to my first game when I was about nine or ten years old. So I played football in the days when we played both ways at Commerce High School. We actually left Madison County schools and went to Commerce. My brother and I had to play football and I played both ways. I played quarterback on offense and what today would be called cornerback on defense. And it was a small school so I played basketball and I ran track and I played center field and baseball. So you know, my world was occupied with sports, which I loved, because I loved to be outdoors, I liked things physical. But at age 11, I learned to drive a car. And at 12, I was driving trucks in the field, as well as mules. And so, uh, I'm adventurous, and I started to talk about my mother a while ago, because my mother was, uh, was, a, was a very confident person and a very outgoing person, but she had fears about things on farms, and people get injured, and so she was always over-concerned about us. And so that caused me to be cautious, which turned out to be good, uh, once I learned to be not overly cautious, because to be a good fighter pilot, you have to be very confident and very adventurous and risk-taking, but you have to be good at risk-taking or you'll die very quickly. So being able to calculate the risk versus reward and go right to the edge but not over it and get killed was actually a, a fundamental thing in my profession that I kind of came about, some about my personality, but a lot about just in the way I grew up of being adventurous, but always having that uh, awareness that there's real danger out there and being able to balance the two. And that played out in my years later when I was a POW as well, that ability to go to the edge and uh, execute very risky things and not get caught. <laughs> it was kind of like a cat and mouse game at times because I'm jumping ahead there. So I wanted to fly, uh, but you know, there was nobody in my family that was flying. I didn't know anybody, anybody flying. I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, but it was brand new and we didn't have the internet. We didn't have counselors in school to tell you, help you figure that out. And so there was nobody in my life to walk me through that. But the University of Georgia was nearby. And so that's where I was going to go to college and get my degree. But quick as I got in, of course, it was and you had to be, back in those days, a member of some ROTC for two years. That was a land-grant college rule. So I got an Air Force ROTC, and I really loved it. And at the end of my sophomore year, I was in pre-med because my brother's brother who played football was a doctor, and so I knew about doctors, and it was interesting. It, there was some risk and adventure in being that, and I liked science. But as quick as in the end of my sophomore year, I passed the written and the physical. I did really well on the written because I'd been studying airplanes all those years. <laughs> and uh, so they said, would you like uh, uh, a contract to become a pilot? Air Force ROTC, your junior and senior year, you'll be on contract and then you get a pilot slot when you graduate. And I said, absolutely, that's what I've always wanted. I just signed right up. And then I headed across campus and changed my major from pre-med to history so I could kind of coast through. I, I didn't want to, uh, you know, I was not a good student. I never knew how to study, not very disciplined with academics. I was probably ADD and didn't know it because I just couldn't sit down and study very long. So fortunately from my upbringing and having a good memory of hearing things and seeing things, I was able to get through the University of Georgia in four years, which now is not the norm, by the way. <laughs> They've, they string it out because they're having a good time. They go five and six years. but. 
I was working my way through school, so I had to get through and get out. Three days after I graduated and finished University of Georgia, I entered flight school in Valdosta, Georgia at Moody Air Force Base. And you can't imagine, or you probably can't imagine after hearing my story, how thrilling that was and uh, how excited I was. And whereas a lot of guys were very concerned that this is going to be hard and this is going to be difficult and we got to work hard at this. And Lee Ellis went there to play and enjoy flying because <laughs> I didn't have any money in college to play much, so now I get a paycheck every month and I got a nice apartment on base and a paycheck and I've just bought my new car and Valdosta State College is 10 miles away. So, you know, flight school was one wonderful year. Uh, and I did well flying. I had good flying skills and all that, so it all went well. I dated a lot of the girls at Valdosta State College, uh, but I knew that we were probably going to go to the war and I just kind of kept my distance from getting too, too involved and so I had a girlfriend or two but uh, I just knew that wasn't for me right now. I was in a wedding or two for a couple of my friends who met girls at Valdosta State and got married and one of them didn't come back and uh, that was the sad part of our era that we lived. In August of 1966, 53 weeks after going to Valdosta, I received my wings. And that was a big day. Mom and Dad was there, my girlfriend was there, uh, all that. But, you know, that assignment said F-4 Phantom Pipeline Southeast Asia, which meant as quick as they could get us combat trained, we were going to war. The war building up quickly in Vietnam at that time so Southeast Asia meant it could be Vietnam, it could be, Cam uh, Lao uh, no, well, we were going to fly in Laos. It could be uh, assignment to Thailand because we had air bases in Thailand that were bombing over the north and in South Vietnam. I was assigned to George Air Force Base in the high desert uh, of Southern California near Victorville and Apple Valley. And Roy Rogers lived just around the corner from where I lived, and I went by his house every day going to work. So it was a neat place, uh, high desert, doesn't rain much, uh, uh, a little bit cool in the wintertime, wind blows a lot, but we were 90 miles from Los Angeles, maybe an hour and a half, and about two and a half uh, hours over to Las Vegas. I never went to Las Vegas, but we were right on the main highway that goes from uh, interstate from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. The flying was great. We did everything they did in Top Gun, plus we did the air to ground the bombing and strafing and all that. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, we played some golf along the way. And one of my buddies uh, that I met in our uh, survival school and then became close friends with was a guy named Lance Sijon. And so Lance and I were both single and we had a lot of fun together. We met a lot of uh, young ladies around here and there and uh, uh, played a lot of golf. We went off to war together, Lance didn't come back. He's the only Air Force Academy graduate still to be awarded uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was shot down two days after me, evaded 46 days in Laos uh, where he was shot down with badly, badly injured, crawling 46 days, finally captured, escaped, captured again, brought to Hanoi, and he died in Hanoi about 30 or 40 feet away from me and I didn't know it was him that was delirious and yelling and screaming until two years later when someone through covert communication passed to me the Lance Sidon story and I realized it was my buddy Lance. Uh, after the war I became good friends with his parents and Janine, his sister, and I uh, are good friends and we collaborate and she's working on a documentary right now that will be premiered in June of this year about Lance's story, and uh, it's a great, great story. He's a wonderful human being, a very rare human being, of being both uh, a mission results-focused person and being a relationship person, someone we all respected and loved, and he didn't make it, and we honor him, as with all of our veterans from Vietnam. Jumping ahead there, but backing up, so Lance and I were at George Air Force Base, and we had some interesting experiences there, 
uh, flying, uh, incredible flying. Uh, we would take off in the morning on a flight of four and fly below 500 feet, below 200 feet sometimes at faster than 500 miles an hour. And when you're a kid that plowed mules but always wanted a hot rod, <laughs> it was great. And, you know, you know, the, you talk to, I listen to podcasts uh, called Ready for Takeoff Podcasts, and it's all aviators. And almost all pilots really became infatuated with flying somewhere between the age of five and ten. And they never let go of it, and they end up flying. And there, there are exceptions to that, but that is the rule. So here we are doing what we always wanted to do. Um, I had one interesting story that uh, I'll tell because it, now it's because, it wasn't so famous then, but now it is. Uh, I met this lovely young lady, there are two of them, and both brunettes, both beautiful college girls, and uh, one of them's father retired. She was home for some reason, and so she left, and that left the other one. And her fiance had just been shot down in Vietnam. He was just like me, except a year ahead of me. He was a class of 64 from the academy, so I'm class of 65 from Georgia. And actually, because I was a distinguished graduate from Air Force ROTC, I got to go to flight school with the Air Force Academy, class of 65. And that's why Lance and I were uh, classmates in flight school and in our training. So she was in shock and trauma, really, in recovery. She dropped out of school to come home and be with her parents. And so we were having dinner at the club one night, and she said, would you like to uh, go to my father's retirement ceremony Friday night? And I said, probably not. I said, I wouldn't know anybody there. They're all colonels and people like that, and I wouldn't know anybody. She said, well, he, he was General Doolittle's co-pilot on the Doolittle raid. I said, well, what time does it start? I'd love to be there. <laughs> So I went, and it was an interesting night because there was General Doolittle, Mrs. Doolittle, and the Cole family. That's Colonel uh, Cole, who's 97 and still alive, or maybe 98 now, and, and the Cole family. So it was like a kid's soccer game, you know. The crowd is with General Doolittle, and then you know you polite to be polite, you have to rotate. And then we go to Mrs. Doodle and talk to her about her gardens at Hilton Head or wherever. And then we go back to the Cole family and talk about his career, and then back to General Doodle all night long. But it was a great memory that I had being locked up in the POW camp to have met General Doolittle and, and to be with the Coles. Uh, General, uh, Colonel Cole was quite a guy and uh, his family was wonderful people. So it was, it was a real privilege, a uh, special to be in that opportunity in that, that particular situation. So we go to Vietnam in the end of June 1967. Lance and I and our buddies got on a chartered uh, Continental Airlines flight from Travis Air Force Base, California, near San Francisco, to fly to uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines to go through Jungle Survival School, which was a requirement en route to Vietnam. In fact, we have assignments to Ubon, Thailand, which is a good deal because there's no war going on in Thailand and you get to sleep at night in the barracks where there's no war going on or in the BOQ. No war and then go fly, fly and fight and get credit for your missions and all that. Well, we took off and we leveled off and sure enough, Lance and I Quick as we got leveled off, we're back talking to the flight attendants. We got date with these, we call them stews, stewardesses. We got dates with these gals for dinner the next night in Clark Air Base. And Lance and his, uh, the lady he met, really hit it off, Lenora. And if you read the book, Into the Mouth of the Cat, about Lance Sijon, you'll read about Lenora. Uh, they dedicated an F-4 at Mitchell Field in Milwaukee last uh, Memorial Day of 2017 and I met Lenora again for the first time. But she would drop in occasionally at Da Nang as part of her Continental crew. They came over and picked up Marines and took them back home, and we would see her from time to time. The wars are very, wars are always very interesting, uh, how things happen during wars and connections are made and all sorts of things. There's always uh, romance, adventure, all of that packed in with the, the trauma and the dying and the injuries that go with war. 
Well, we went through jungle survival and then on to, uh, and, and as we were getting ready to leave, and they said, everybody go into Ubon, Thailand, stand up. Sai John, not you. Ellis, not you. You're going to Da Nang. So our orders got changed to Da Nang. They needed pilots there, so we go to Da Nang. And so right away, we started flying combat missions. Now, Lance and I were right out of pilot, undergraduate pilot training, so we were flying in the back seat of the F-4 at that time, flying with majors and captains in the front seat. Uh, but we're pretty strong personalities, and of course, we quickly adapted and got a lot of experience, so we were flying with new guys in country, checking them out. About half the time, we were flying with new front seaters who had just come in, who didn't know the rules of engagement, and didn't know the terrain and the area of operations that we were in, so we had that opportunity. So we, in a way, we kind of became their instructor pilots, so to speak. We were pilots, and we flew about half the mission, and they flew about half. They had some switches in the front we didn't have in the back for the bombing runs and that sort of thing. But it was a team effort, and uh, we uh, quickly started to rack up uh, sorties. And by November, I was on my 53rd uh, sortie over North Vietnam. I had others in Laos and South Vietnam flying in support of the Marine Corps, where you were, Tony, and uh, the Army. So those were good, really good missions, and we enjoyed those. But most of our missions were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Flight ca is called uh, interdiction missions on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which means we fly up and down the Ho Chi Minh Trail day and night. We flew eight-hour shifts three shifts a day, and we'd rotate two weeks on the first shift, two weeks on the second shift, afternoon, e early evening, and two weeks on the late night shift, and then we'd rotate to the next shift. Uh, so we had airplanes ready to fly and in the air flying missions 24 hours a day, patrolling the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the goal was to stop the flow of war materials into the South, supplying the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army that were in the South. So it was uh, a busy time, and you know we we bought Seco watches when we got over there because you could buy them for eleven ninety five, ten ninety five, eleven, and a really expensive was about twelve ninety five, and it had the day of the week on it, and Sunday of the day was red, and so that's how we knew it was Sunday because every day was exactly the same, seven days a week was always the same. Time passed fairly quickly. Uh, I've been there a couple of months, uh, two and a half months, and so uh, they said, hey, would you like to go to Tainan Air Base and uh, pick up an F-4 and bring it back here? We have an inspect and repair facility in Tainan, the island in the island of Taiwan. And you'll go, over to the, you go from here to the Philippines and then fly over there and pick it up. So I did. It was a nice trip, you know, a way to get away, kind of a little R&R &R away from the uh, the base and away from combat. So I went, a major and I went over. We had a really good time, picked up an airplane, brought it back. And I get back, and I've been back for a few weeks, and Lance says, hey, um, Lenora's coming to Bangkok uh, the first week of November. Let's go. I'll, I'll get her to get you a date. Let's go to Bangkok. And I said, Lance, I just was gone for about 10 days. I gotta get my counters so I can stay abreast of my peers and go home when they go home. And he said, well, you know, I didn't go on one, and I'm going to Bangkok. I really wish you'd go. And I said, no, nah, i got to stay here and fly. Okay. I go, well, he goes to Bangkok, first week of November. I go down on the 7th of November. He gets back that afternoon and finds out, uh, well, the next day, the 8th. He gets back the 8th and finds out that I've gone down, and then he goes down the next day. Now, the report says that I was shot down by anti-aircraft artillery attacking a gun site, which is all true. But I'm convinced uh, that the airplane, well, the, the airplane blew up the minute the bombs came off the rack. We, you know, as a pilot, you feel the bombs. They, you know, we had six, 750-pound bombs come off the airplane, and you can hear it and you can feel it. That's a lot of weight, and the airplane kind of rises up slightly when the bombs come off because there's a lot of weight going off. And less than two seconds after those bombs came off, our airplane blew into several pieces and started tumbling. And the wingman said the airplane, later the wingman said the airplane blew into three pieces. So it's pretty clear to me that the, in retrospect, that we were the first of about 10 airplanes that were blown out of the sky over the next 60 days by a new fusing, the FMU-35 fuse that had just come out and it was electronic.
and it was supposed to be a delayed fuse so we could drop them and they would lay on the ground and go off later when the trucks came by or whatever. And we weren't uh, committed, we weren't supposed to have those kind of fuses, that kind of fuses that day, but I think that's what happened because I've never heard of an airplane being hit and blowing up into three pieces unless it was hit by surface air missile and there were none of those around. So. I'm pretty sure that we were the first, Lance was the second. He went down two days later. His airplane blew up on a bombing run just after bomb relief. His airplane blew up. And then that continued to happen until our DO refused to fly those fuses anymore. But I lost uh, my roommate and myself, uh, my roommate in the combat zone. Lance was across the hall and down the hall a little bit. He was in a sister squadron and my, my roommate, Doug Condit, went down uh, about three weeks after I did. He didn't come back either. His airplane blew up. So finally there was a mission where they spread out and watched the bombs come off and they saw one, it, the bombs explode right after they came off the airplane and they were bombing. This was the high altitude sky spot and they saw the bombs explode and there was no anti-aircraft artillery, the bombs just exploded. So they confirmed what it was, and so the pilots started to refuse to fly, and the RDO, Colonel Boots Passay, who was kind of famous, went down to 7th Air Force in Saigon and told the general, you can court-martial me, but we're not flying those fuses anymore. Yeah. Lee, can you tell us what a DO is? Uh, the DO is the colonel who's a director of operations. He's in charge of all flying operations. Now in the Air Force, that's called a... Um, Ops Group Commander. They've made it a commander slot. Ben, it was a staff job, but it was uh, be the same as the CAG in the Navy, uh, the, the Combat Air Group uh, Commander that runs the Air Group. The DO is re responsible for all flying operations on the base or the carrier. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Colonel Boots Passe was uh, 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 an ace in the Korean War and very famous in the Air Force. He wrote a little manual called No Guts, No Glory for air-to-air -air combat. And he was a great pilot, and uh, I actually flew with him a good bit, and we were friends there, and I met him right after I came back home. He was a two-star general then, so. My airplane blew up, 7th of November, 1967, over enemy territory, over uh, the gunners that we'd been bombing. And I knew I had to eject, so I immediately, uh, we were gonna die in two seconds, we were gonna hit the ground. And so I pulled that handle to eject, and so did my front seater right after I did. And uh, it's all automatic. When you pull that handle, it automatically blows the canopy. It automatically, this projectile explosion that occurs under the seat by the gas tubes that run up, blow the canopy, and then project your seat with you in it about 60 feet in the air to get away from the tail and the, away from the airplane. And then automatically it, the man seat separator activates and it throws you out of the seat and the seat goes one way and the pilot goes the other way and as the seat went that way, my D-ring from my parachute, my lanyard from my parachute is attached to the seat and it pulls it automatically so everything happens automatically once you pull that handle. In less than two and a half seconds, I'm checking my parachute. The training was great. Uh, we knew exactly what to do. I didn't panic. I was just, you know, and you talk to any combat person or any EMS person, when you're in, a, in chaos in the heat of the battle, you just go to training by the numbers. One, two, three, four, five. That's what you do. So we're, we were very well trained and that's what I did. So uh, I, was, I wasn't afraid then. I was just operating on knowing what I had to do to make sure everything's okay and then do everything possible to evade capture. That's my only thing in my mind is how can I evade capture? I tried to slip my parachute to the river, which was a couple of hundred meters south. Those old parachutes didn't slip very well. Uh, I activated my beeper. I did a perfect parachute landing fall and I didn't have any injuries. I hit all the points just like a paratrooper. I'd been so well trained. Pulled out my radio, disconnected my parachute, jumped in an old bombing crater that was there. We'd bombed this area before. I jumped down in this crater about three feet deep, pulled out my radio, called the wingman. I said, I'm on the ground, 200 meters north of the river, start strafing at 300, I'm headed south. Well, I saw these guys at a reunion after the war, these pilots, my wingman, and they said, you know, we heard your radio call, but we decided we couldn't shoot that well. <laughs> we might hit you. And I said, that was a good call because they were surrounded me within 30 seconds, they were capturing me. So. Uh, 
I tried to frighten him. I had a 38 revolver and I had two rounds of, I had an empty chamber under the hammer, Old Smith and Wesson. And I had two rounds of tracer and three rounds of ball. And I thought, we had been told in survival school that the people around you, militia, they're rookies when it comes to capturing POWs. So that's your best chance to get away. And I said, okay, these are rookies, I'll see. So I fired a round of tracer right over their head and I said, get, you know, get away, get away. And I fired that round of tracer. Those guys didn't flinch. They just went like this. And one of them pulled out a little pointy talkie, like a little tiny comic book. And on one side, it was in his pocket. On one side, it had phonetic Vietnamese to English. And on the other side, it showed a picture of a pilot holding it with his helmet on, holding up his hands. And it said, Sharinda, no die. And so here's this guy in, in the heat of all the, and, and the, they're shooting at my wingman. And it's just chaos. And this guy goes, Sharinda, no die. Sharinda, no die. Hands up. Hands up. And I decided that's probably the best advice I was going to get that day. And I went like this. And they pounced on me and started. They couldn't do the zippers on my survival vest and my G-suit. So they finally just whipped out a big knife and started cutting. And that was scary. And, of course, now it's all over for me for right now as far as uh, getting away or resisting. I'm just totally out of control. And that's when the shock hit, the fear, the shock, the trauma of what, you know, it's like, uh, what is it, uh, what kind of, in that movie, what kind of story uh, have, I, have we fallen into? I think it's C.S. Lewis' story, uh, then Tales of Narnia. What kind of tale have we fallen into? That's kind of the way it was. What have I fallen into? They stripped me down to my jockey shorts, and I'm terrified, and then they gave me my flight. They searched me, gave me a flight suit back, not my shoes, boots. And they moved me up to a village. They tied my hands. They blindfolded me. And uh, I'll kind of expedite a little bit to say I had about a 30-second uh, connection with my front seater, Captain Ken Fisher. Uh, we were in an underground bomb shelter, and I had long enough time to say, Ken, is that you? I heard somebody breathing hard. He said, yeah. He said, is that you? And are you okay? And I said, yeah. And then they separated us. And they, put it, they had a rope around my neck like a dog on a leash walking around. And my hands are tied. And they got a blindfold on. And they're pulling me along. They pull me back behind the vill village to village, hamlet to hamlet. Really, it's what it was. It wasn't village. It was hamlets. I get out back, and I look down beneath that blindfold, and I see this ditch. And my mind flashed the stories about the Korean War where the POWs have been taken out back, in some cases, and just shot in a ditch and covered up. And I thought, oh, this is how it's going to end. So in a moment of pure panic, I'm about to die. I just turn, I think, the only thing I can think of is I'm going to face him face on, and he's going to shoot me face on. He's not going to shoot me in the back. And I turned around, and, and I threw my head back so I could see up under that blindfold a little bit. And here's this guy with this gun like this, and they're yelling and screaming. And one of them grabbed me and spun me back around, facing the ditch again. And same thing. It's like, I'm not going to be shot in the back. And I spun back around. And, oh, they just went crazy. They're yelling and screaming and cussing in Vietnamese. And another guy grabs me and spins me around again. And this time he kicked me right in the butt. And I got over balance. And like we used to do on the farm, I just did a flat foot jump. The ditch was only about this two feet wide. And I jumped over the ditch. And when I did, they jumped over and started laughing. And all they wanted me to do was jump the ditch and go to the next hamlet. So <laughs> yeah, sometimes what we assume is going to happen, thank goodness, is not what really happened. So uh, that was a great relief. And I guess then I thought, OK, maybe I'm going to live through this. Now, I grew up in a strong Christian home. And I always believed that God had a purpose for me and that uh, I could trust him. And so at this point, I was kind of like Ronald Reagan was later when he was shot. I said, okay, I lived through this, so there must be something yet I'm supposed to do in this life. So my job is to hang on and do my duty and be a good soldier and get through this. So that kind of became my moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, month by month, year by year commitment then. So I get to Hanoi. Uh, 
Took two weeks to get to Hanoi, during which time we were bombed by American air power three times. I watched bombing raids come in uh, and drop bombs about two, three hundred meters from me, and I climbed out of a foxhole, and there was a piece of uh, shrapnel. You know, bombs blow up. It's just iron being red hot iron being just pieces of shrapnel thrown every which way, and there's a pieces of red hot bomb shrapnel about this long and this long laying on the road right beside where my box hole was. So that was kind of interesting. The local populace came after me two or three times. And the good thing was the militia guy in charge of taking me north, probably a sergeant, was a great soldier, a really honorable person. And he, he and his soldiers protected me. He had orders to bring me in alive. And he was a good man, and he protected me. I'd like to—I've been back to Vietnam. I didn't get a chance to go back to this area, but I'd sure like to see him again and shake his hand because he was really a good man and took care of me um, along the way to get me to Hanoi. So we get to the Hanoi Hilton. Now, I didn't—at the time, didn't know it was called the Hilton, I don't think. I learned that uh, after I'd been there a little while. But all the American POWs were in one— uh, corner, the top, uh, when you, I guess, the northwest corner of that place was we call Little Vegas. Now, everything has to be named. Somebody had named it the Hanoi Hilton. That was a dark humor thing, you know. When you're, when you're in trouble, you have to have dark humor. You have to have laugh, even when things are terrible. And so they named it Little Vegas in that cell blocks. There were several cell blocks, and they were all named after the casinos, the old casinos in Las Vegas. So I went into the Thunderbird, but down the hall was the Mint, and that was the solitary confinement cells. They were three and a half feet by six and a half feet, okay? Little bitty cells. And then there was a Desert Inn and the Stardust were two other small cell blocks. And then there was a Riviera and the Golden Nugget, which were transition areas. There were some wash houses outside. They didn't have roofs on them, but you couldn't see. The whole thing was to keep us from seeing any other POWs, keep us totally isolated. And my cell was a six and a half by seven foot cell. You know, that's uh, the size of a very small closet or a very small bathroom. Uh, that was the size of my cell for the next nine months. And it wasn't just me. There were four of us in there total, three other guys and me. And... Uh, and our bathroom was a three-gallon bucket, and thank goodness it had a lid on it, and we had to empty it every morning. We only got out uh, to pick up our food twice a day, and that was uh, six months of pumpkin soup with a side dish of a couple of tablespoons of stewed pumpkin and either a cup of rice or a small baguette of bread twice a day, about 9.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the afternoon. We had about three months of cabbage soup twice a day and three months of what we call sewer greens, twice a day, and that was uh, like chopped up lily pads. Now, being a country boy, uh, that was an advantage. My roommate from Long Island, New York, hadn't eaten so many vegetables in all his life. He had never <laughs> eaten collard greens and turnip greens and all that stuff. He had meat and potatoes, but uh, uh, we had rice and our bread and veggies. And a thin, watery soup with a piece of pig fat floating in it and not much, but it was boiled. And that was critical because that helped us protect us from the germs. All our food was cooked and the water was boiled. So they, the communists did some things right. Um, and the thing I think to understand about the Vietnam War is the problem was the communists, not the Vietnamese people. We all love Vietnamese people. They were wonderful people. And I met a family on the way north and stayed in their home one night and they were wonderful people, you know, just like people in Georgia or anywhere else. So. Uh, and some of, today, some of my best friends are Vietnamese people living in this country. And when I went back in 2016, you know, Vietnamese people are wonderful, just like every country in the world, wonderful people. So that's kind of uh, gives you an idea of my initial uh, shoot down and capture and arrival in Hanoi. Now, during those uh, next nine months, uh, I got there November the 21st, just before Christmas, just before Thanksgiving, just before Christmas, and you know, there was a lot going on. They were capturing a lot of people the fall of 1967. Operation Rolling Thunder was at big, big pace, and they were shooting down and capturing a lot of people. So 
they were busy. The interrogators were busy in processing, interrogating a lot of people. So I didn't get really interrogated much of any serious consequences until after uh, the 1st of January. And they were building up for a big PR campaign at Christmas time to get some photographs, photo ops, to show the world how well they were treating us. So they did serve us a special meal, and some guys, the Catholics, all got to go to Mass downtown. They blindfolded them, put them in a truck or a band, hauled them down to Mass, a few of them, maybe 15 or 20, downtown to Mass ceremony, where the Catholic priest uh, lectured them about participating in the war and during the mass and and we got we heard some of that on the radio and now every cell in in North Vietnam where American POWs was that had electricity had a uh, we called it a bitch box in it where three times a day we got propaganda trying to convince us they were right and we were wrong they also were telling us right after Christmas. They started telling us that we were war criminals. Well, they always—that was a big shock. We had gone through some pretty good training, but we'd never been told that we we're going to be treated as criminals, war criminals, and that was the big shocker because they told us we we're going to be uh, tried as war criminals, and we might not ever go home if we didn't collaborate and cooperate. They didn't say collaborate, cooperate with them and help them in the war. Because what they wanted was us to make anti-war propaganda. And that was the battle. We wanted to live by the Code of Conduct, be faithful to our country. The Code of Conduct has six articles called the Fighting Man's Code. But basically, you won't surrender of your own free will. You'll uh, keep faith with your country and its allies. You won't make statements harmful to them. Uh, you'll keep faith with your fellow POWs. You'll, if you're a senior, you'll take command. If not, you'll obey the lawful orders of all those above you. And uh, so that was, uh, and you'll avoid answering questions other than name, rank, service number, and date of birth, because that would get into giving them information. So our goal was to live by the code of conduct and deny them any advantage by having us as POWs, because they wanted to take advantage of us uh, as hostages. So it was a battle every day. Uh, to, they tried to destroy our dignity. Uh, they wanted to make us bow to their, every time we saw them, we're supposed to bow. And that was a daily battle. And you know they would beat us over the head until we'd bow. And, and so some days we'd bow. And when we'd get our courage back up again to take slappings and beatings, we'd not bow. And it was just off and on, you know, just like guerrilla warfare going on all the time. But they, I was called into interrogation, and they wanted me to, well, they brought a three-page biography to our cells. We figured that they were collecting a dossier on pilots to build a database on pilots, American pilots, for the Russians. But they wanted to know everything about our family and how much money our parents earned and what kind of work they did and where we had been assigned and what kind of schools we had been through and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, I put down name, rank, service, number, date of birth, and left the rest of it blank because those four were the big four that we could give and did give. And then they came back and hauled us out into, and hauled me out of interrogation and my buddies went to and I refused to give. And I had a good cop, bad cop, you know, one interrogator's tell me that he doesn't want to hurt me but the other guy's really bad and he will torture you and put an electric blow wires on your heart and on and on and on. So I kept refusing and eventually uh, it did lead to torture. And it was kind of what we call the humane torture in that we were put in stress positions. So, uh, my hands were uh, in well, handcuffs, my legs were in leg irons, <clears throat> and I was put down on the floor in the concrete floor slab with my uh, hands above my head. And so, okay, well, that's no big deal. Well, you know, after hours, my hands would cramp and fall over. and. Uh, my knees would cry, wobbly and I'd fall over and when I did they'd come in and start kicking and beating. So we went back and forth over that for you know all night long and the next day and finally I decided okay I was just worn out from all that and I couldn't figure out a way to beat them and I said okay how am I gonna how am I gonna win this battle and I was kind of negotiating with myself and I couldn't come up with a plan that I could keep going in this forever. So somewhere I'm going to eventually I'm going to give in. So my plan was, okay, I'll give in, but I'm not going to give in. And although I didn't know the company 
policy exactly on how to fight this battle yet. Uh, what came about was about what what became what was uh, later learned the company policy, so to speak, uh, the guidance from our leaders, and that was to take torture up to the point of permanent physical or mental damage, and then the more go ahead and give in, give as little as possible, and then bounce back because you got to stay in the battle. The one thing you couldn't do was totally go until you were totally submissive, because then they would have you. You would do what they wanted. So I gave in, and so I filled out their three-page biography, and the only thing that was uh, accurate on that three-page biography of the name, rank, service, number, and date of birth was my father's first and last name, and I put down the town where I went to high school. It wasn't actually our uh, mailing address, but we knew the postmaster and the post people in that town, and everybody knew me because it was a little bitty town in Georgia, Commerce, Georgia, and I'd played football. My mother taught school there. My brother and his wife taught school there, and we knew everybody in the post office. So I just put my father's first name, Leon Ellis, and last name in Commerce, Georgia. And that way, I knew it, uh, it was protecting them, but at the same time, I was hoping to get a letter. And uh, that was my, uh, my angle to get a letter someday. So I'm laying on the floor of this torture room, this filthy floor in my handcuffs and leg irons and ma uh, blindfold and crying like a baby because I wasn't tough enough to beat them. I felt so ashamed that I let my country down, that I let my teammates down. I wasn't able to beat them. I was just weak, just a weakie much weaker than I ever thought. You know, I played football both ways. I tackled 190 pound running backs. I never backed off from anything. Combat flying, no problem. But this was something I couldn't beat. And I was so ashamed. So I get back to my cell and eventually we all get back together and I find out the other guys have gone through the same thing. And uh, we ended up in the same place. Some went less time than I did, some went more time than I did before giving in, but we all did exactly the same thing. We filled out the thing with a bunch of BS and, and that was it. And then later they wanted me to make a, uh, a few months later they wanted me to make a tape. They wanted me to record the news for the camp radio, which I went through the same thing again and eventually I agreed to do it again. And so I got on there and I got, the, I said, I, I can't talk, I need some something to drink. And so they brought some hot tea and I got a mouthful of that in, and I, I, was, I couldn't. And we we would read words, you know, you know. Uh, one of the funny ones that one of the guys did was Chicago for Chicago, and uh, just messing up the language. It was in subtle ways that they couldn't catch, and they couldn't catch us. But all the guys back in the cells heard it, and they got a laugh out of it. The best one was one of the guys, uh, Alan Brudno who was a brilliant guy from MIT and the Northeast guy. But uh, he went through the same thing and he got on the radio and he was reading the news about um, uh, the Paris peace talks and so-and-so's. And our beloved uh, leader, president, is supposed to be Ho Chi Minh. He said, and our beloved leader, president, horseshit men. And of course, back in the cells, everybody is just rolling in the floor. <laughs> so we were, it was, it was that always, you know, they could beat us, but they couldn't beat us, you know. We were going to fight back and not give up. And that's where you had to stay in the battle. You had to always see they were the enemy, we were the good guys, it's us against them. And okay, so you got me today, but you really don't have me because I'm about to pull the string on you. You know, like uh, the one guy was tortured and uh, to say who, who was the commander that ordered him. No, who are, the, who are some of the people in your, as a Navy guy, who are some of the people in your squadron that refused to fly combat missions against North Vietnam? Well, nobody, okay? But they weren't gonna accept that. So finally, they said, okay, it was Captain Ben Casey and Captain Clark Kent, or Lieutenant Ben Casey and Lieutenant Clark Kent. Well, when you know they got out, the peace people, the peace delegation that came over told them that Americans had made, these Americans had made them look like fools because that, everybody in America knew that was a joke that they were basically saying, you know, something, something's fishy here. 
And so those guys got tortured and put in solitary confinement for a long time because the peace people ratted on them, basically. So anyway, that's was, that was life in the POW camps. And, but most of the time, so much of those years were hours and hours of boredom. And we had to come up with ways to keep up with time. Well, your, your mind kept up with the days of the week. People say, how'd you keep up with time? That was the easiest thing. Your brain, I can tell you, I was shot down on Tuesday. I got to Hanoi on Tuesday the 21st. I mean, everything, the days of the week, the months, your brain, there was not many noise going on, so your brain kept up with all that. But we could remember almost anything. You know, when you're sitting there hours and hours, kind of like in Unbroken when Louis Zamperini was in that um, raft for 46 days, he was able to remember almost everything. And that's kind of the way we were. You take away all the noise and it's all there in your brain. So we would spend hours and hours reflecting. I, I played golf courses in my head. I went back and played Apple Valley Country Club, Hesperia Country Club there in the high desert of California over and over. Uh, the Commerce Nine Hole Club in Commerce, Georgia that I'd kind of cow pasture golf course there that uh, was all we had back then that I'd learned in college. Played those again. Uh, spent a lot of time reflecting on myself you know, I have pretty strong ego, very confident fighter pilot, and uh, thought pretty well of myself, I guess. And in that situation, though, I was able to see my dark side. And I was really ashamed of some of the things that uh, I had done. And, you know, I never did anything bad. But my uh, kind of being judgmental and being kind of, uh, it was kind of a hereditary thing, and a hereditary but cultural thing in my family. And one side of my family, was a little bit looked down at your nose at others because they were very well educated uh, on my mother, one side of my mother's side. The other side wasn't, they were all farmers. But that kind of penetrated into my world of uh, thinking and so I had to really uh, rein myself in and realize who I was and see the dark side. I was kind of lazy, had a lot of nightmares about um, the war those were just battles, but the nightmares about going to class and not having my homework and having a test and not being prepared and feeling inadequate, those were there. And so I, in a POW camp, I learned to focus, I learned to think, I learned to plan and to think several steps ahead. Eventually, we got a chess set, a really primitive chess set. And Captain Ken Fisher, who was by that time my senior ranking officer, taught me how to play chess. And that was a real gift because I learned to think ahead in ways that I'd never done before. Uh, I spent, uh, one time spent uh, several days thinking about my eighth grade class and where every person in my eighth grade science class sat and their names and where they sat just for something to do, mainly because Ms. Jordan, her teacher, had taken up homework and I hadn't done mine. So <laughs> I got off on that tangent. I spent, I spent a month one time deciding, uh, I thought, what am I going to do when I go home? Okay, I know I can go in the military, but I don't need to think about other things. So I said, I, I, maybe I'll be a lawyer. And I spent a month thinking about what kind of lawyer I would be and where I'd go to law school. Just, and I would think about it for hours a day, planning, and I would interrogate my teammates. We had a covert way of typing and then later talking through a blanket through the wall in the cells. And uh, I learned all I could about being a lawyer and law schools and all that. And then one time I farmed for two months. Now I started with 40 acres. I didn't have to pay any taxes and I could set, I tried to be reasonable in prices for barbed wire and land and fertilizer and all that. But at the end of two months, I owned almost the whole county. I had my own feed mills and railroad sidings. And, but I would work 10 or 12 hours a day on my farm mentally. Some days I'd get a headache from working on it so hard hour after hour. I have no idea now how I could do that, but I did. But that was normal. Everybody did. It wasn't just me. All the POWs did that. So it's just uh, the human mind, human body are so amazing. We had no medical care. You know, we got sick with the flu in the winter. One time pink eye went through. I didn't get that, but probably 60% of the guys in the camp got pink eye. I didn't get it, but uh, we just wear, the body would just eventually wear it out. Everything that you can get sick from, eventually, usually, the body will wear it out. And, uh, you know, our diet wasn't the greatest. And in fact, uh, a lot of guys got very, very, I think I had a touch of it once because I started having a lot of aching in my thighs uh, all the time. 
But some of the guys before I got there in 1966 were in a camp where the diet was so bad that about half the camp got beriberi and some lost their vision, their, not their vision, but they lost their flying vision uh, from that. And uh, so, but that guy became a four star, he's the only one of us that became a four star general. Our leaders, uh, we had three senior officers that were shot down, uh, four actually, that were shot down in 1965. Now I got there in November 67. So they had been there more than two years when I got there. And they were commanders and different senior ranking officers in different camps and sometimes the same camp and one would be locked up in isolation without contact. But they all, in, each one spent more than four years in solitary confinement. They were there seven and a half years. They were beaten and tortured the most of anybody in the camps because they were the senior ranking officers. They're always trying to break them, trying to get them to make propaganda, stuff like that. These guys were incredible. Reisner, Denton, Stockdale, and Larry Garino, Colonel Garino. Amazing. And then Colonel Bud Day, who was older, but tortured a lot and in very bad condition for a long time. He wasn't there as long, but he was in bad condition and older. He was a World War II veteran, a Marine from World War II, and then became a fighter pilot. Okay, Stocktail died early at 82. Bud Day and Robbie Reiser were two months short of 89. Denton was 90, and Garino was 92. That's how long they lived, which proves that suffering will not kill you. It can make you a better person. Nobody wants to volunteer to suffer, but suffering won't kill you. These guys live really fruitful and long lives. Uh, General Boyd is probably 81 now, and he's flying his C-34. Last year, in, he, I saw him in a flyby, he did the missing man pull-up, flying his T-34 in a flight of four T-34s over the missing man monument at Randolph Air Force Base for a big uh, celebration there. Uh, so you can imagine being 80 and flying your T-34 around the country and riding his motorcycle. <laughs> so our guys have uh, done well. I think one of the reasons we did well, one, we had great training, two, we had great leadership, three, we were a little bit of a select group because it was mostly air crews and a little bit older. I was the youngest guy in the camp generally, and I got there when I was 23, uh, just turned 24 rather. So most of the guys, the average age was 30 at capture. So we were a pretty mature group. If we'd been all 18 year olds, we wouldn't have stood a chance because you don't have the life maturity and the resilience. Uh, an 18-year-old doesn't as a 30-year-old, and that leadership made a difference. But another thing that most people don't know that made a big difference for us was when the National League of Families, the wives, especially starting in San Diego and Fort Walton Beach and Jacksonville and Virginia Beach and Phoenix, they started to get together, the MIA POW wives, and a lot of them didn't know if they were MIAs or POWIs. They just knew their husband was missing. They started to get organized. And then, just for mutual support, because they had something in common. And then one of them said, you know, the government has told us to be quiet. It's in our husband's best interest, our son's best interest to keep quiet. So after two years, they decided, some of them decided, this is not working. We need to go public. We need to get a movement going to get account of, we need to find out who is a POW. We need to make the communists in North Vietnam tell us who's a POW and get Red Cross in there to bring Red Cross uh, uh, and, and letters. Red Cross packages and letters. That was their main thing. Accountability, accounting, who's there, Red Cross letters package. And humane treatment. Because they knew by this time there was some information leaking out that we were not being well treated. So they committed to do that, and Carol Hansen, who was a widow, uh, at that time an MIA wife of a Marine helicopter pilot, she's the one that really started it. Uh, Admiral Stock, Commander Stockdale at that time, his wife was a senior naval officer wife. Colonel Bud Day's wife, Doris, was one of the senior uh, Army uh, Air Force POWIs down at Fort Walton Beach. They all got organized. And then the National League of POW MIA families got going, and they went to, uh, Sybil Stockdale in my book, uh, Leading with Honor, uh, I talk about Sybil, had four teenage boys. She rented a house in, uh, in the 
island there in San Diego and moved to and rented a house in Washington, D.C. as the chairman of the National League of POWMI Families, and she started meeting with President Nixon and Kissinger and the Department of Defense, and they started putting pressure on And finally she said, look, here's the deal. In a nice way, either you start, you change your policy and start raising hell about our men and putting pressure on them to give an accounting, or we're going to do it. And so if you don't do it, you're going to be opposite us. You can, you can align with us and come alongside and get on our float, or you can be against us. You've got a choice. Well, these guys are politicians. They're not stupid. So the U.S. government changed its policy, and within six weeks, the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, was at the podium, beating on the podium, talking about the communist treatment of POWs and lack of accounting and so on. And then along comes Ross Perot, H. Ross Perot, a man in his 40s who had gone to the Naval Academy, graduated about 1954, gotten out, was a top salesman in IBM, left there and started his own company called EDS. Great patriot, and he knew a lot of the POWMI families in Dallas, and he came alongside with the money because he's a millionaire, successful businessman, and when Ross Perot puts his mind to something, it usually happens. He funded and encouraged the wives, the families, in this operation of the National League of POWMI families to the degree that many of them were able to fly to Paris and confront the communist delegates, diplomats at the, at the POW, uh, at the um, Paris peace talks, where they were negotiating around the square table and then the round table. For years, they were negotiating. And so, like Phyllis Galani was chairman of the National League from the state of Virginia, and she got over a million signed letters and petitions, and she took these other wives did too, big mailbags of letters. This was a PR campaign and dumped them out in front of the delegates, the communists in Paris, and they got the media there and they took video and pictures and this came out around the world. Well, the communists wanted all bad PR against the U.S. That's what they were making money on. All of a sudden, they're getting bad PR. This all happened the spring and summer of 1969. Well, things have a way of happening. Ho Chi Minh died in September of 1969. And it took the, the uh, uh, Politburo of Communist North Vietnam about a month of meetings and negotiating and jockeying around for them to come up with a new ch chairman and leader. And the new leadership in Hanoi decided they didn't like the bad PR and that they probably needed to change our treatment and start trying to get good PR. And so that's what happened. Within a few weeks, they stopped all the torture. And the summer of 69 had been hell. The summer of 69, the way to compa combat the bad PR was they were torturing guys in my camp. I was out at Sante, the camp that was laid at, raided in the fall of 70 by the Special Forces. Um, they were torturing guys, going through our camp, torturing them to sign a statement saying they had received lenient and humane treatment. Now think about that. That's the way communists think. The end justifies the means. And to them, it was true because they didn't kill us. So they gave us lenient and humane treatment. We need to make them sign that statement and we'll show the world. We got them. We'll blackmail them basically with this or we'll combat it with this. But when the communists changed their, our treatment, they, they stopped the torture for the most part. There were a few occasions here and there when somebody was beaten or tortured. But for all practical purposes, we went to live and let live. And that Christmas, we got to write our first letter home, a six-line letter, the Christmas of 1969. Six months later, I got my first letter, the summer of 70, and they started to get packages. So the, <clears throat> the amazing thing is that this group of mostly women supported by Ross Perot and the citizens of this country, took action that changed the policy of the U.S. government, changed the policy of the communist government in North Vietnam, that changed our treatment two years or more than two years before we came home. So we had time to live and let live, locked up, not great food, not great health care, no health care for the most part, a lot of propaganda, 
but we had time to decompress and get our head on straight and month by month, week by week, day by day, to get rid of our anger and our bitterness and our shame and guilt about being POWs and come home in good health and good shape. Our PTSD has been fairly minimal. I mean, most of us probably have had a little counseling along the way. Uh, and it's been helpful. I think we were control freaks for the most part anyway. You're a fighter pilot, you're kind of a control freak because you do, you do, you're in a life and death business like surgeons. They say fighter pilots and surgeons, you can tell them, but you can't tell them much because we think we know everything. And there's a lot of truth to that. We believe strongly in who we are and being in control. But our ability to be successful after we came back has, uh, and to have good lives and good marriages. Uh, most all of us have had very successful marriages. Most of the guys who were single got married within two years. Uh, I met my wife a year after I got, mac got back. Married seven months later, we've been married going on 44 years. Uh, now some of that is because she's a marriage therapist. <laughs> That's helped a lot. But a lot of it was because uh, I worked through a lot of things to become a better person and I learned to live with somebody else 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years. I mean I lived with Ken Fisher for three years and the only time we didn't see each other all day long 24 hours a day was when we were in interrogation or torture. So we learned to put up with another person's idiosyncrasies who was different or similar, or, and we're a very competitive group, so you can imagine what that was like. But we actually learned to get along. So I think the story of the families, uh, of course, they suffered the most, they always do. But the organization, you know, these weren't paid leaders. These just got together, and the leadership they exerted to change our culture to change our treatment and enable us to come home the way we did. You know, we've had congressmen, senators, uh, preachers, doctors, lawyers, uh, business owners to come, you know, uh, generals. We had 17 flag officers to come back uh, out of that group, generals and admirals. And uh, a lot of us made colonels, so, uh, you know, at our 40th anniversary, we were sitting around the table there in San Antonio where we had our 40th anniversary for the POW group. We, we, have, we used to have anniversaries every five years, then we went to three years, and now it's down to two years because we're dying off so fast. You know, we're starting to die off. We're still a lot of us around, but we're dying off, so two years works out about right. So, we, um, But there's about eight or ten of us sitting around a big round table talking. And uh, one of the guys said, you know, I would never volunteer to be a POW, but I wouldn't change a thing. Everybody, everybody at that table agreed with that. Yeah, me either. I wouldn't change a thing. I would never be the person I am today if I hadn't gone through that. You know, I have a leadership consulting company here in Atlanta for 20 years now. and when I speak, and, and when 2012 book came out, I became a professional speaker. And so I talk about being the battle to become, to be a results, mission-focused person and a relationship, people-focused purpose person. Because 40% of the population is naturally results-oriented, mission-focused. 40% is born with DNA for relationships. But to be a good leader, you got to do both. And so that's where the battle is. You got to get some skills for the one you don't have to get a little bit better. You can't change yourself much, but you can practice some skills and intentionally have a learned behavior. The other battle is the battle between confidence and humility. Because nobody wants to follow a leader who's not confident. But nobody wants to follow a leader who only thinks about themselves. So there's this battle between results, relationships, confidence, humility. And to be able to fight that battle within yourself and to have the self-awareness and the commitment to fight that battle is an ongoing challenge. And we learned to fight that battle, I think, in the POW camps. And I think that's helped us to kind of stay grounded and to stay in the battle. And we, we, we will tell you, we're still fighting that battle. I'll always be working to become a better listener. I'll always be working to not be too controlling. <laughs> 
and not to be too strongly opinionated about my opinions and to be humble and not too humble. And uh, I think that's, uh, people want to follow somebody. They're attracted to people who get results and get victories. They want to be on a winning table team, but they also know they're cared about and they're valued and important. They want to be with somebody who's confident, but not too confident, that cares and, and knows self-awareness, but others' awareness. And when you can work on that, uh, it, it makes life very uh, challenging, but fun, and you're always growing. And I'm, I'm headed towards 75, I'll be 75 in October, and I don't want to ever quit growing. I want to always be growing as a person because that's the only way you can become a better leader. You can go to all the leadership workshops, read all the leadership books in the world, but you'll never be, get any better unless you change your behavior. And that's where the battle is, because it's hard to change your behavior. So I tell people, if I live long enough, I could have a job a thousand years from now, because that's human nature and it'll still be the same. I think I've uh, kind of rattled along pretty good for you. Do you have another area that I haven't addressed? Just at the, that's an amazing story. I want to tell you that, that this is probably one of the premier interviews we've had. But at the very end of these interviews, what we like to do is just uh, allow the, the, the veteran to editorialize about any subject they want. You've covered a lot of ground mm -hmm. in your life and, and in this interview, but uh, it's you know, the last few minutes is just for you and mm -hmm. what, what you think, what you would like, the message you would like mm -hmm. to, to leave with people. You know, I, I, have, uh, I have two major themes that I like to uh, revisit in my own life and to share with others. The first one is uh, courage. You can't do anything that's valuable without courage because your doubts and fears will always take you out. Doubts and fears, you read the paper every day, you listen to the media, whatever you do, you see people that behave in a way, they get in trouble, and then they lie, and then they cover up, and so on and so on. Or they don't come through, they don't do their duty. And you think about that in your own life. We all have to do that. And the reason usually is the lack of courage. Our doubts and fears overwhelm us, and we procrastinate doing what we know we ought to be doing. And, I mean, I know this as well as anybody, and yet sometimes I find myself procrastinating doing something that seems difficult. They won't like me, or this seems hard. And I just have to, I catch myself. I've learned to coach myself. That's what I, I like to do is coach myself, because that's the best way. I sit down and say, okay, Lee, what is it, what are, is, what are, your, what are your doubts here? What's your self-doubt? What's your fear here? I identify it, and then I come up with a plan to do what I call the courage challenge. You take the courage challenge. You lean into the pain of your doubts and fears to do what you know is right. We know what's right. 99.9% .9 of the time, we know what we ought to do. The problem is doing it. So come up with a plan and just start walking into it. Now, if you're highly emotionally it's a highly emotional situation, you may not be able to be objective. In those cases, I go to a friend or my wife or somebody who can be objective and I say, here's the situation, uh, I'm pretty emotionally engaged in this, I need to be objective about this, help me get my arms around what's the right thing to do. I want to have integrity, what's the right thing, is this okay? Here's what I'm thinking, is this, does this pass the smell test? and we sort it through and then I go do it. I go with a plan and I just go execute. Usually it's never as bad as, it's almost never as bad as it, the fear was to start with. So the thing is you gotta be courageous. You gotta cross the, the river, the river of courage, you gotta swim across that. The other thing is mutual support. Fighter pilots, Navy SEALs, Special Forces, nobody fights alone. We gotta be in community. The lone arrangers get taken out. When you start hiding or holding back and keeping secrets, that things that you really need to get somebody to brainstorm with you or share your heart with you or just to help you and encourage you, we all need encouragement. 
and you got to have that team. I have one group of people that encourage me and help me think through in one area. Another group in my business area, I have people I can share anything with and they can speak into my life. you got to have people speaking into your life to encourage you and to hold you accountable if you want to stay on course. Uh, I want to stay on course because life's better. <laughs> you just sleep better, you feel better, you have more energy uh, when you don't have uh, things nagging you down of, of failure and uh, shame and guilt. I don't have shame and guilt. And if I have the two, I'd rather have guilt over shame. I'd rather make a mistake and apologize than have shame for not stepping out. So I think those are the two. Be courageous. It's the only way you can do, it's the only way that you can live and lead with honor is to be courageous. And number two, you can't do it alone. You got to have a team. And you're in danger when you're all alone. A leader or an individual who's all alone, whether it's a veteran coming back from Afghanistan, that's their biggest problem. They don't have their team around them anymore. And that's one of the biggest issues with PTSD is they don't have that team. We lived for two and a half years or so with people who had gone through worse than we had, and we could decompress. That was the team, the support team, the community we needed back then. But we all need a community, uh, and I feel very blessed to have one. My wife is a wonderful supporter and blessing. We're very different, but uh, we complement each other in the right ways, and we're aligned on money, politics, and religion faith. So we are, the important things we're together on. And then I have friends and others that are there for me and it makes all the difference in the world. Wow. I mean, that it's, this interview has really been very rewarding, at least for us, I think, to hear your story. And we appreciate what you've done and also sharing it with us. So uh, thank you very much and thank, thank you, you for your service. I have one question. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Can you tell us a little bit about coming home? Yeah, coming home. You know, uh, we knew the war was coming to an end because we knew the B-52s were coming to Hanoi and we could see the fear in the enemy's eyes. And we were cheering. <laughs> we had to take some risk to cheer because they were, we didn't want them to overreact. But we knew they couldn't sustain the war with what was happening. And so uh, we thought, well, maybe this will be the end. Uh, we, we're going to see the end. And sure enough, they brought us back. I was up uh, at that time on the mountain camp with no electricity <laughs> up on the Chinese border. They had taken half of us when the bombing of uh, mothers, when the bombing started again in spring of 72, when the North invaded the South, the U.S. started bombing the North again. They took half of us and put us on the Chinese border, like an insurance policy, like if Hanoi gets wiped out, we still got our POWs here in hand. Well, as the agreements were about to be signed, they loaded us in trucks and brought us back. And that was a totally different trip coming back than was going up because we were relaxed, no, no handcuffs, no leg irons, no, no blindfolds. We were just traveling back, and we traveled in the daytime. So we get back, and we go to a camp where we, all of a sudden we see that we're all in that camp. We're captured between uh, August of 1967 in February 68, so we know this is going home group. We've been there, <clears throat> oh, four or five days, and they call us out in the courtyard, and the camp commander came out and said, I am here to tell you that the Paris Peace Agreement has been signed, and that you will be going home in the next 60 days in accordance with the U.S. final withdrawal from South Vietnam. You will go home in groups. So we figured it out. Okay, we're not, we're, we're, we're not the early group. We're not the middle group. We're probably later. And that was correct. So John McCain, who had been captured 11 days before me, we'd been in the same camp a couple of times, but we'd never seen each other face to face. We knew each other was in there. We memorized names. And of course, he was famous because his father was an admiral. And so I'd heard about John McCain. So now I meet him face to face. He can hardly walk. He's had broken legs and broken arms, both arms broken. And, but he had a great sense of humor. And we were out walking in the courtyard. Uh, interestingly enough, because of the, our, over the years, we never wanted to get too high emotionally and be disappointed. 
because we weren't going to go home. Initially, I could handle six months, and I said, I can handle six months. I'm going to go home for the July Mexico Olympics. That's going to be my celebration. Well, July of 68, I was still there. And I said, I can make it one more year, 69. The summer of 69, I'll be home because LBJ will, you know, this, the war is going to end. We're going to go home. No, it didn't. Summer of 69, I said, I can make it two more years, but it was really more like three and a half. So we've really learned to flatten our emotions. We didn't want to get too far down and get depressed. We didn't want to get too excited and to be disappointed. So our emotions went flat like a table. So when they read that proclamation from the actual the protocol from the Paris Peace Accords about our release, we just stood there in formation and listened. And we turned around. We weren't going to start cheering. We weren't going to give them the photo. Op. We turned around and just walked back into our cells. We could have stayed out in the yard. We just walked back in our cells and started talking about it. Hey, it looks like this may happen, but it's not over yet. We've got to wait and see. And then on the March the 14th, 1973, they came in and said, okay, guys, go down to that room over there in the warehouse in the camp. Go over and pick up your clothes to go home. And we went down and picked out a gray shirt and a pair of uh, blue cat. Uh, trousers, cotton trousers to wear, and a little jacket, and a little ditty bag, <coughs> and a pair of shoes. <laughs> we hadn't had any shoes. We'd had uh, tire sandals all those years. Went back and put them on, and about lunchtime, they took us out near the airport to a little park, and they gave us a sandwich and a bottle of beer, and they said, okay, we're waiting for the call, and the call came, and we drove to the airport and got on the 141s and loaded up uh, three 141s. We had about Oh, 30, 40 guys in each one. We had a hundred, about 120 went out that day on March the 14th, and that was the third big group to be released. There was one on February the 12th, another one February 28th, and this one March 14th, and then one at the end of the month around March 29th or 30th that came out in four big groups. So that was coming home, and then we flew to Clark Air Base. Uh, we didn't cheer until we got airborne. You can feel the gear come up. Uh, we got airborne. And we started cheering a little bit, and then when we got feet wet, uh, that's a, military, a flying term, we got over international waters, the uh, aircraft commander comes over the intercom and said, we're now feet wet <laughs> over international waters. And the stomping and cheering, and, and we got up and moved around. They hand out cigars and cigarettes. I lit up a big uh, cigar. I'm not a smoker, but cigars are good. I lit up a cigar. There's a couple of nurses. We go around hugging the nurses because we haven't seen any women in five and a half years except the, the, chogi, the girls that carried the chogi poles, or the water food in. We land at Clark, and there's a red carpet and a reception, you know, people cheering. We had no idea that was going to happen. We get on a bus, go to the hospital, get our hospital pajamas and gown, and they say, uh, the meal's going to be in 30 minutes. And, man, we were ready for that. <laughs> And it, sure enough, because other groups had been released, they knew what we wanted to eat. We wanted breakfast first, and then we wanted steak and ice cream and pie and cake. So I went through the line. I got eggs and sausage and bacon and toast and uh, all the orange juice and coffee and sat down and ate a whole bunch of that. And then went back and got a steak and some potatoes and ate that. And went back and got cake and ice cream, or pie and ice cream, and ate that. And... Uh, one guy, Leroy Stutz, ate a dozen and a half eggs and then ate his steak. <laughs> he was a football player from Kansas, farm boy. So uh, they knew what to expect by the time I got there about our eating. We didn't have a problem eating anything. Uh, we were there two days. We got a haircut. Uh, we got a uniform. And that was really neat. And then we came back in groups. 141s, they flew in and put us on 141 that was going to the uh, we were going back home to the nearest Air Force Regional Hospital. And uh, the Navy guys would go to their nearest regional hospital. But in our case, uh, we were coming to Montgomery, Alabama, because I was from Georgia, and that was the nearest Air Force Regional Hospital. The big hospital was in Montgomery. So my parents and my brother and his family came over, and uh, we refueled in Hawaii on the way home and then landed in Montgomery on Saturday, St. Patrick's Day, which this year... To 2018, the days of the week are exactly the same as they were the date. So I landed in St. Patrick's Day was on Saturday, 1973, and this year St. Patrick's Day was on Saturday, and that was my anniversary of getting home. 
uh, the Navy guys from Jacksonville in our group, like John McCain, flew back with us, but then they got off our plane and got on C-9 and flew to Jacksonville where their families met them. So my mom and dad there, and we had went to the club that night, the officer's club at Maxwell, and had a great dinner, and they stayed for about three or four days, and then they went back. We stayed on base, <clears throat> and then they went back to Athens. I stayed two more weeks and had debriefs every day for two or three hours and hospital appointments every day for two or three hours. And so I, I had a hospital room and a room in the BOQ, and I slept in the BOQ, and every morning I go to the hospital like it was my office and uh, stayed there for two weeks and got all that done. And then I flew to Atlanta. My mom and dad picked me up there and I drove to Commerce, Georgia, my hometown, where, you know, most Vietnam veterans got spit on and terrible reception. The war had ended and the POWs were coming home and Commerce, everybody there knew us because my mom had taught, my brother and my sister-in-law had taught and I'd played sports there and had a lot of friends there and so everybody knew us and they had a parade but on the way over there, you may remember, there was a song called Tie Yellow Ribbon by Tony Orlando. And it reached number one uh, that month in March, April, May of 1973. And there were yellow ribbons tied. <clears throat> Along Interstate 85 from Atlanta, we got off the interstate. Uh, it wasn't, well, I guess it was complete. In the old days, you had to get off in Brazelton, but we, all the way to Commerce, there were yellow ribbons, and then they had a parade, and I was the only one in a parade. And so we'd drive along, and I'd meet people and shake hands, and they're all cheering. And, and I remembered everybody's name. <laughs> we surprised them. And they said, uh, finally, you know, we'd stop, and I'd talk to people for a minute or two. And, Finally, somebody said, how do you remember everybody's name? And I said, well, I haven't met many new people in six years. I've been thinking about you guys, which was the truth. I had thought about so many of them. And the names came back and uh, uh, went home. And uh, I stayed at home. Uh, I'd work on the farm in my parents' home for yards and everything for about three or four days. And, I'd, and there were some free, free trips and stuff. And I'd go off and for two or three days and come back home and work for three or four days and go off for three or four days. And uh, the Air Force said, uh, so uh, would you, you, are you thinking about going back into flying? And I said, oh yeah, if, you, if that's an option, that's where I want to go. They said, we're going to start requalification for the Air Force pilots that want to go back into flying in uh, San Antonio at Randolph Air Force Base in June would you like to be in that? And I said, yes, I would. So first week of July, I took some vacation. First week of July, I showed up at Randolph Air Force Base and uh, I was very fortunate and uh, my flying skills came back quickly. I didn't have much flying time, but uh, I had good skills and they came back and I requalified, became a T-38 instructor pilot, went to Valdosta, Georgia, uh, had been there uh, about two months. I got there in March of 74 and uh, uh, Memorial Day weekend, I met this beautiful young woman. <laughs> Seven months later, we were married, and the rest is history. We have, uh, she had two children. We were married. She had been married previously, and they were seven and five. And I became instant father, and I knew nothing about parenting, nothing. I, I've apologized to my kids uh, many times for my uh, lack of skills at being a good parent. Uh, they've turned out to be very excellent parents. Uh, I've congratulated them on that. And then we had two more children. So we have boy, girl, boy, girl, and they range in age from 50 to 38. So have six grandchildren. And so life, is, life has been good. Like everybody else, you know, we've had our ups and downs in our family, but uh, overall, we're all close. Our children are close. Our grandchildren are close. And, you know, even though we've all had to uh, go through things that you have to go through in life. We're all close and love each other and enjoy holidays together. There's not any negativeness in any way in our holidays and that's a blessing that uh, is very special. Great. Awesome. So. Okay. Awesome. Again, once again, thank you and we really appreciate hearing your story and, and thank you for sharing it with us. Well, thank you I have an advantage 
that starting in 2011, as my book was finished up, I became a professional speaker. So I've shared it, and I've written two books on it. So I have an advantage there. Well, you did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you for your service, and welcome home. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored, honored to be here and, uh, and tell the story because I think uh, there's something in there for everybody, you know? Yes. Yes. And I just... I'm glad that people cared yeah. about you guys when you came back. They did. Yeah, they did. And, and I just feel so, so badly. I, I just want, I wish I could share that feelings that people gave us then and still give us. I wish I could share that with the veterans. That, that uh, didn't get that, because I, I cannot imagine. There's nothing worse than doing your best and not being appreciated. Oh my gosh. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Oh. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. Mm -hmm.